So, you call yourself a swing dancer? Here are four facts that you need to know. Number one, Benny Goodman had a humble beginning. Benny Goodman had been raised in a Jewish ghetto on Chicago's west side, one of 12 children to immigrant parents who had fled Russian-dominated Eastern Europe in the late 19th century to escape its brutal discrimination against Jews. At the age of 10, Goodman, with two of his brothers, joined a band organized by the neighborhood synagogue. He showed immediate promise as a clarinetist, and through a series of serendipitous events, Goodman, despite his lack of financial resources, wound up studying with the brilliant clarinetist Franz Schope. On nights when Goodman wasn't playing himself, he and his pals sneaked into famous Chicago night spots such as Dreamland and The Sunset, where they gazed wide-eyed at King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, and Earl Hines. Number two. Benny Goodman was a big Billie Holiday fan. Goodman had become a fan of Billie Holiday after traveling with music promoter John Hammond several times up to Harlem to hear her sing. In fact, in her autobiography, Holiday said her first recording sessions with Goodman came at the band leaders, not the promoter's insistence. It was said that they briefly dated. Billie Holiday said in her autobiography, that Goodman eventually asked me to make my first record with him. I'll never forget it. Benny came up to me and took me to the studio downtown. When we got there and I saw his big microphone, it scared me half to death. I'd never sung in one and I was afraid of it. Those sessions are now considered significant for reasons other than there being Holiday's first recording date. Although Benny Goodman can't take full credit for it, they marked the first time Goodman served as leader of an integrated studio band. Number three, Benny Goodman exposed swing music to the masses. While the roots of swing music clearly lie in earlier forms of African-American jazz performance styles, swing as we know it may just have been born at a specific time and in a specific place with an electric performance by one particular big band for one particular enthusiastic audience. That time and place was August 21st, 1935 at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles, California. It was a promising start to an engagement Goodman hoped would salvage a summer tour otherwise judged a failure. Goodman stuck to relatively staid stock arrangements during the first part of that night's show, and he began to lose the young crowd. Before their return from the first intermission, the band's drummer, Gene Krupa, is said to have urged Goodman, if we're gonna die, Benny, let's die playing our own thing. It was at that point that Benny Goodman famously pulled out Fletcher Henderson's arrangements along with all the stops on his talented orchestra to the crowd's immense delight. One ecstatic attendant said, the kids went nuts, jitterbugging wildly. Because of this exuberant performance witnessed by thousands of young fans in the live audience and millions more tuning in to a live radio broadcast, the swing era was officially born. Number four. Benny Goodman was the first to play swing in a concert hall. Benny Goodman made history on January 16, 1938, when he took the stage for his Carnegie Hall debut. It was not only the first time jazz was performed in the hollowed hall, but also an unprecedentedly publicized presentation of Goodman's groundbreaking, racially integrated ensemble. This performance was the first time that hard-swinging, uncompromising jazz took the stage in a concert hall helping to further legitimize the genre as an art form. Benny Goodman was worried the show wouldn't sell because attendees would have to sit instead of dance as they were so accustomed to doing at his shows. Ultimately, he was proved wrong when the concert sold out weeks in advance. In addition to Goodman's own big band, the evening featured members of the Count Basie and Duke Ellington orchestras. Benny Goodman didn't know the concert was recorded after the performance, Goodman was given one of two copies of the recording, which he put away in his apartment and forgot about. Years later, the recordings were rediscovered, at which point Goodman had them released as the famous 1938 Carnegie Hall Jazz Concert. It went on to become one of the best-selling live jazz albums of all time. I love Benny Goodman! Where would the entertainment industry be without his influence?
I mean, think about it. Would there have been interracial bands? Would there have been a subsequent civil rights movement 30 years later? Who knows? This was an unprecedented time in history when people were actually segregated and this guy literally had blacks and whites in the same band. Now, of course, he can't take credit for all of it, but, but he was one of the few to jeopardize his entire career because he believed in the freedom of this music more than the socio-political restrictions of the time. Benny Goodman is one of those kinds of people who's right in the middle section of artistry and craftsmanship, and he's just been able to merge it together seamlessly. I probably have to say Benny Goodman's my number two artist of all time. I don't care what color he is. So if you guys want to get more of his music to swing dance to, I encourage you to sign up for my class below, or you can get access to all of my favorite swing music and my approach to teaching Lindy Hop. You can learn everything in about 40 minutes worth of time and be inspired with some really good Benny Goodman tunes. If you like what you've seen today, make sure you subscribe to the channel to get more information on swing dancing, swing music, and swing history. If I don't get a chance to see you in real life, hopefully I get a chance to see you in my class online.